our moon could be hiding way more pockets of water than scientists used to think. Its surface has something called cold traps. Those are areas that are in permanent shadow. If you could stand near one of the moon's poles, especially the South Pole, you'd see such shadows all over the place, 15,000 square miles of them. There are tiny cold traps that are only 0.4 inches wide. And there are hundreds and thousands of bigger ones. These regions are in eternal darkness and might have even gone without the slightest ray of sunlight for billions of years. And now, scientists think they're hiding much more than we thought, including small patches of ice, no bigger than a penny. But still, something astronauts could use to drink or for their rocket fuel. The majority of the water could be stored in glass or somewhere between grains on the surface of the moon. One theory says 15,500 square miles of the lunar surface could have the capacity to store water. But no one can prove it until someone goes there in person or sends rovers that would dig under the surface. The moon is not entirely white and devoid of color. Apollo astronauts that landed there in 1969 said the moon was a bit brownish. Later studies showed some dark lunar areas display hints of brown and blue. Highland regions are yellowish, with faint traces of pale and pink. Colors are not the same everywhere because of different amounts of various metals that are present on the moon, like titanium or iron in the surface minerals. Our eyes are not sensitive enough to pick out such differences from this distance. But the majority of the lunar surface consists of minerals that are naturally gray. And that's mostly the color we see from our planet. When you're in space, you can't walk on the ground. No gravity, so no need to wear shoes. That's why astronauts mostly wear socks, or eventually add another warmer pair if they're cold. But something strange might happen to your feet while you're up there. First, if you have calluses, they may fall off after some time. One astronaut described his experience and said the bottoms of his feet became very soft, while the skin on the top of his feet became very rough, like alligator skin. He engaged the top of his feet to get around when he was using foot rails on a space station where they stay. It's not easy up there. Astronauts on the International Space Station, ISS, have to use foot rails and loops to remain steady when they have to do regular things like just getting a haircut. When they want to do training, they can strap their feet into sneakers on the exercise equipment. It's essential for them to exercise way more than they'd have to on Earth, around two hours each day, because the human body isn't used to moving or performing any actions we normally do without gravity that kind of holds us together. Plus, if you stay in space for a longer time, you can lose much of your bone and muscle mass. For example, you can lose almost 20% of your muscle mass if you spend only 11 days in zero gravity conditions. But if you were up there, there's no point in using weights, right? Zero gravity affects them too. Instead, astronauts mostly use a device outfitted with two small canisters that create a vacuum and allow them to pull against a long bar. On the ISS, you can also use a bike and a treadmill. Did you know that NASA spent millions of dollars developing a pen that you could write with in zero gravity? A pencil is not the best solution for space travel. They have a habit of breaking and shattering, which can leave graphite dust behind. Also, they're wooden, which brings a high risk of fire in the pressurized, oxygen-rich capsule. That's why even such an everyday thing as a pencil can be life-threatening in space. So they had to develop the space pen. It writes crisp and clean and can't rely on gravity to make the ink flow. Instead, it uses compressed nitrogen to force ink out of the nozzle. This way, you can write while you're floating upside down or even submerged underwater. Even when they're up in space, astronauts still face everyday things like that unpleasant itching sensation on their faces. They can't just satisfy it while in their spacesuit they need to improvise, so sometimes they scratch the spot with a microphone attached inside of their helmet. Sometimes they attach patches of Velcro inside their helmet for such things. One of the most complicated issues with space trips is how to protect astronauts from space radiation. Our body has not evolved to handle proton storms and cosmic rays coming from the sun. 
Of course, spacesuits and the rest of the equipment are essential. Some research also showed an antioxidant-rich diet that usually includes a bunch of vegetables like spinach, tomatoes, and beetroot is promising when it comes to reducing the bad effects of radiation. Astronauts didn't always wear white spacesuits. During NASA's first manned spaceflight project called Project Mercury, they had silver suits. But none of the astronauts went out and explored the vacuum of space back then. Silver is not a good color for that, because spacesuits have to be highly reflective. White is the best for that. That color is the most effective for reflecting radiation while in outer space. We're on Earth, which means the atmosphere is like a shield that protects us from 77% of radiation coming from the sun. But astronauts don't have such protection up there, and this means they're very vulnerable to severe sunburn and extremely high temperatures. A white spacesuit helps, the same way as white paint on your walls helps you keep an entire room cooler. A lighter color will absorb 35% less heat. White is not the only color in their closet. When heading into space or coming to Earth, they sometimes wear a bright orange suit. It's a color that attracts attention. So if anything goes wrong during landing and astronauts have to quickly leave their ship, the rescue crew will spot them more easily. But times are changing. So today, we have more sophisticated tools to locate astronauts that need help, such as GPS trackers and transponders. So suits don't have to be orange anymore. Floating through space, everything's peaceful and you're enjoying the magnificent view of the dark and quiet infinity filled with billions of stars, planets, comets, suns, moons, and so many other things we'll probably never even discover. 95% of our universe still remains a mystery to us. But at least the view is awesome. But it's only good if you're tethered. What if something goes wrong on your spacewalk and you detach? The whole scene goes from a beautiful dream to a nightmare in a second. But don't worry. NASA has designed a special jetpack called SAFER, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. It fires compressed nitrogen from 24 thrusters, which is how it can steer the astronaut back to safety. In theory, you could vent some gas from your suit too, or maybe throw a tool in the opposite direction, which is how you'll push yourself forward. But it's tricky because you'd need to throw it precisely in line with your center of mass. Otherwise, you'll just start uncontrollably spinning. And before you know it, you'll become so disoriented, you'll have no idea where to go, even if you could. But SAFER will automatically detect rotation and use its jets to help you stay oriented towards the safe spot. It took scientists 10 days to teach a goldfish to drive a car. They taught it to move its own tank towards a certain target. And in return, the fish gets a treat. This research could help us navigate through space one day. There has to be some mapping happening in our minds. That's how we potentially link our body parts and movements to changes we go through when we're in space. That's how we'll know how far we can extend our arm to reach for a cup of coffee without going too far and knocking the coffee over. The movement control is not the same as under the force of gravity. And we need to be sure if such maps in our brain differ between sea and land or if it's something universal. So when I say scientists taught a fish to drive, that basically means if the fish saw a target, it should touch the wall of the tank facing the desired direction. That way, scientists could guide the wheels and move them where the fish wanted to go.